Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. Welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell. Thank you for joining me on another episode of I Am Dad Podcast. Glad to see you. I'm glad to be seen, right? A good friend of mine always says it's better to be seen than to be viewed. And so we count it a blessing every day. I can be seen. And so thank you again for joining us. Um, it's been such a pleasure, pleasure to see all of the comments and reactions and emails and people calling. It's just been kind of a cool thing. Um, I love doing these things because I get to talk to um, many of my favorite people in the world. And today is no different. Uh, we are talking today to my good friend, Lawrence Wilbon. Um, he's a distinguished leader in the not-for-profit sector for over 25 years of dedicated service. Lawrence currently serves as the Director of Business and Program Development at Fathers Incorporated, where his expertise in fund development and strategic partnership plays a critical role in advancing the organization's mission to support fathers and families. Before joining Fathers Incorporated, Lawrence made a significant contribution as the Director of, the, of Education at the Louisville Urban League, where he was instrumental in creating educational and violence prevention programs that have positively impacted countless lives. His leadership and commitment to community betterment has been felt across various roles, including leading his own local not-for-profit as its executive director. A proud alumnus of the Ohio State University, where he met his wife, Dr. Matisa Wilbon, Lawrence is not only a champion for fathers through his professional endeavors, but also a dedicated husband and father of two living in Metro Atlanta. Today, we'll dive into Lawrence's journey, his impact on fatherhood and families, and the insights he's gained from his extensive career. What's going on, Brother Lawrence? Wow, good. Listen, I, I'm listening to that bio and I'm thinking, who is that? Uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good to hear um, hear read out loud. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me today. Yeah, not a problem. I try to make people feel comfortable and warm how important it is like to be um, authentic, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I been off script and talked about a whole bunch of other things, but you know, people are gonna look at this video and be like, "Yo, who's that dude? I need to have him come and speak. I need to have him, um, you know, be around. I need to look at him for mentorship." But we're gonna talk all about all that stuff during this podcast. So I know you've watched tons of these episodes. I know you know how I lead this thing off. I'm mm -hmm. sure you're prepared. I gotta stop stop telling people what I do because they do come on prepared sometimes. And so, but that's cool as well. Well, here's how we're gonna start it off. Like we always start off. I am that podcast. Tell me your daddy story. Yeah, that, that every time I hear that, I'm like, oh, Lord, here we go. Um, so, uh, you know, because there it, it, it was kind of hills and valleys. So um, my my daddy's story, I, I share the experience that I was actually raised uh, with my father not being in the picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went through my entire life um, from my adolescence, teenage, college years, not having a a clue who uh, my father was. I knew his name, um, but that's all I knew. And I knew he had a, a bunch of children. So I knew that part too. So my mother would make sure she let us know. <laughs> he got a lot of kids. Um, and so when I was about 35 years old, um, I had one of my siblings uh, reach out uh, to me on Facebook and he inboxed me, you know, and I thought it was one of those, you know, you know, give me $1,500 and you'll get $5 million deposited into your account immediately kind of scenarios, one of those scammers. And so he reached out to me and said, hey, man, I think I'm your brother. And I said, oh, OK. I said, tell me more. So we continue to talk through Facebook for at least almost three weeks, um, kind of chatting. He And then he started revealing so much about my life and my he knew, my, knew of my mother, knew of 
you know, my mother's siblings and things like that. And so we exchanged phone numbers and we started talking more on the phone. Uh, and then uh, I was going home for Thanksgiving one year. I think I was 35 at this time, going home for Thanksgiving. And I said, well, let's 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 coordinate a meeting to meet meet my father. And so we went and uh, went home and I met him. And so at that moment, and this is where the story is, everything that I've always questioned and wondered, I felt like it was, I I was given the answer right then. I'm I'm a tall guy. I'm 6'3". He's 6'6", 6'7". You know, I've, my, you know, my demeanor, he carries some of the same demeanor. So I saw myself in him and everything came to tr- to light right at that very moment. So and I will say in the midst of that, in the midst of meeting him, you know, he did one faux pas, one thing that I didn't appreciate. And in the midst, he said, in the midst of it, he said, man, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you. And I said, I get it. I said, let's not talk about that right now because we're just meeting. Let's, we, can, we got time to kind of talk through that. Mm-hmm. And then he said, but man, I was a good looking man back in the day. So, you know, I just wanted a bunch of women. I said, like, yeah, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. <laughs> this conversation just turned left. Yeah, yeah, so at that moment, I was like, wait a minute, sir. Uh, at that time, he was still sir. Uh, I said, that, that's, not the, that's not the response you give to your son when you first meet him. Right. And uh, he's, he apologized. And, uh, we tried to continue the conversation and build a relationship, but then he was diagnosed with cancer. And I think he was probably already diagnosed with cancer. And then two years later, he transitioned. And so um, so it was short lived, but it, it was a moment for me to be able to, you know, some of those unanswered questions got answers that day when I met him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't typically do this, but because I know you and I know your story, mm-hmm. um, you also had a incredible relationship with your mom. Um, Lawrence is also a twin, y'all. Yes. And yeah. so um, she transitioned not too long ago, a few years ago. Yeah. And um, we was there to kind of, you know, be with you through that. But I know that she left a um, impressionable impact on your life. Talk a little bit about her. Yeah. So so mom was I, I think mom, my mother and the people probably could say this. she was probably the best mother that anybody uh, would ever want. Now, I say that because she. She oper- my mother was very strong, operate- operated with a uh, strong fist, read between the lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> so you didn't get out of line too much um, because she definitely handled us. But I think her impact, the impact she left in my life was um, my work ethic, my my ability to love individuals. My mother loved folks unconditionally. Um, she you know, one one of the struggles that I did have with her was the fact that she kept us away from my father. Um, mm-hmm. And I and we had this conversation um, while she was still alive. And I said, Mom, I said, why did you do that? She said, well, she said, well, the, the only excuse I have is I knew about his lifestyle and I knew things that he was dealing with. And I didn't want you all raised around that. And so um that was her reason. Um, and so I had to live with it. Um, even when I met him at 35, her response was like, what do, need to, what do you need to meet him for? You're grown now. You don't need him. I'm like, right, I'm grown. So I need you to tell me I can't go meet this man. Um, but no, she was an amazing woman. And her, her passing actually shook um, my very soul um, because her passing was so sudden. Um, she, it tra- she transitioned in a matter of hours and, um, my sister and I, my brother was alive at the time too. My brother's now deceased too, but the three of us, we, we took it really hard. And I think it was a bigger toll on my brother. Um, because, you know, they say people die from a broken heart can die from a broken heart. And I really believe that he took it so hard that he couldn't bounce back. And so, uh, he transitioned a year after she did. Um, and so my sister and I are extremely close. We're twins, but we're extremely close. And what has held us together is um, the fact that my mother has always taught three of us, you are all you got. 
this is it. This is all we got. So mm-hmm. y'all better hold tight to each other because, you know, you may you may get married, you may do all this, but at the end of the day, you still all you got. And so that's why we stay so close. Wow. Um, I want to stick with family <clears throat> for a little for a little bit because I just know how important family is to you. Yeah. Um, but you met this incredible woman on the campus of the Ohio State. The Dr. Ohio State. <laughs> Dr. Matisa Wilbon, she serves as Fathers Incorporated's co-chair of our Monahan Institute for Fatherhood Research and Policy and does a bunch of other work with us. She's a dynamo. Yeah. Um, and it's very easy um, to see um, how the two of you connected. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about her, but talk to me more about what she adds to you. Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, she is my heart. She's my heart. I we met very young. So um, I think I was 21 when we met and she was 22. Um, And what she brought to my life at an early age was some some stability. Um, So I'll I'll be honest, what you see now and even the bio that you read. (laughs) (laughs) Ohio State was a place where uh, I cut my teeth. And <laughs> I got to live what they say the best life. Um, uh, so she brought stability um, to my life at an early age. And so when we met, um, I realized, and it was short lived, I realized that she was going to be my wife. Mm. And I tell people the story all the time we dated for six months only. And then I proposed to her. And five months later, we got married. And uh, we'll be celebrating 25 years in November. Of wow. being married, and so, um, so she brought stability. And I always laugh uh, when I, when we, she and I do a lot of um, uh, webinars and things like that as couples and stuff like that. And people will say, "You married up," you know. They'll say stuff like that. And I said, "Well, well, let's be clear. When I met her, she was Tisa. Like she, she was from Eastern Kentucky." Uh, <laughs> So I think I had something to do with all the accolades that she has now, um, because as we grew together, because we literally grown up on each other, grown up with each other, um, she supported me through so many different things. And I equally supported her through her journey in education. There were moments in, in our marriage. I would say, are you ever going to get out of school? Because she (laughs) she literally was in school for like 13 years. It felt like 13 years. I'm like, when are you going to like get out and like, you know, start working? Um, uh, But we support each other through so many different things. And I think I'll I'll say this last point. I think our relationship is a testament of people dealing with challenges um, because I, I think about her family um, she has her own daddy story. Um, and um, there were times in our marriage that I realized that I was fulfilling a place. I believe I was fulfilling a place that her dad might not have uh, filled. And she and her dad are really close there. I mean, he lives 20 minutes from here, 25 minutes from here. Um, and so um, there were places in our 25 years I felt that I was filling a role. Um, where she had some love that she needed and I, I stepped into that place. And so, um, and then likewise, I talked about my mother earlier about being a great mother, but my mother, because she had so much trauma and so many things happened in her life, that love bug um, mm-hmm. and that emotion, that compassion, she, she, she exhibited it, but it wasn't many times we got a lot of hugs and kisses. And I mean, she was very strong and, you know, one of those kind of individuals. And I think my wife played a role to meet some of those needs that I was missing as well. Yeah, no, I love hearing her daddy story. She tells it different every time, which is why I always (laughs) ask her it, because I think what happens is when I ask her it, when I ask her the question again, there are little small elements that she might have left out before that she kind of adds and she peppers them in. That gives me a much fuller story Mm -hmm. of um, who she is. Um, the two of you have also um, experienced a lot of grief, yeah. you know, with the loss of very close people, including your mom, mm-hmm. you know, her brother, um, other close siblings, friends. Um, how is how is experiencing that grief for the two of you strengthen your relationship? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, because she and I, 
well, more her than I, she does a lot of work around grief. Um, and that's part of the work she does and it's helped so many people because of her work. Um, she, I, I, shameless plug, she did a, 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 a TED talk uh, called Good Grief and um, it's it's streaming everywhere. So, um, but I think you're right. So we have experienced a lot, a lot. My mother, her mother, both of our grandparents, you know, on both sides, um, uncles, her brother, was the most recent passed away almost two years ago. Um, and these were not individuals that were far removed. Like we were intimately involved in the, and they were intimately involved in our lives. And um, I think what has helped strengthen us is that we allow each other to grieve the way we need to grieve. And so I, I, I t- when my mom passed, um, when we got that call, <laughs> I remember falling out on the floor like you would, you know, some of those churches mm-hmm. when people like, I literally <laughs> fell out on the floor and was screaming, right? Lordy, 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 yeah, Lordy, 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 take me. You know, it was one of those, <laughs> one of those moments. And I'm on the floor curled up in a ball um, in a fetal position crying. Mm-hmm. And I remember at that time, she didn't know what to say or what to do, but I felt this hand on my shoulder and I felt her lean on top of me and was just hugging me. And then immediately after that, I felt four little hands. Didn't know what was going on, but those four little hands were hugging me too. Mm-hmm. And those were the kids, they, the kids came into the room. They didn't know what was going on, but they were crying with me. Didn't know, they just saw me on the floor crying. And I think at that moment I realized um, she allowed me to grieve that I, the way I needed to grieve. And I, you know, been through counseling and dealt with those kind of things. And, um, I'm still dealing with it. Losing your, losing your mom is, is really hard. And then fast forward, her mom transitioned and she was in the room. She was there through hospice with her. And we ex- had her mom live with us and, you know, her, her, terminal cancer was was taking her out of here and um i've allowed her to grieve the way she needs to so there are days when you can tell i can tell now when she's grieving and she's thinking mm-hmm. about her mother and i just fall back i'm there in the background i'm there when you need me um same thing with her brother. I'm there in the background but it's it, at every moment in both of our lives when we dealt with um, these traumatic issues, she and I have both been there. So I think that's what strengthened our relationship. We, I'll say this last thing. We were on a marriage retreat, I think a week ago, two weeks ago. And one of the things that she and I said into, cause we're the oldest married couple there. So, and we're young. So it's weird <laughs> to say that, but, <laughs> but we're young. I just got the gray here, but literally I am young. And, um, one of the things we came out of there, we talked about how when you deal with so when you deal with issues in your marriage and in your life, if you got somebody that got your back and gonna roll with you until the wheels roll fall off, you can make it through a lot of stuff. And that's mm-hmm. what you and I've done for each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that line because that was actually a line in one of the uh, Martin episodes when he found out that Tommy and uh when Tommy was telling him that he was seeing somebody, right. and he kind of hit him in the chest. He said, "How's it feel when somebody got you?" Right. And so, <laughs> like you know, that 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 term resonates. Yeah. So, um, and I think that that strengthening of family ties for you guys leans into where I'm going next. Yeah. Um, both you and Matisa are adoptive parents. Yeah. yeah. And so, and it takes a certain kind of person, people, couples. Um, to adopt children. Yeah. And when you spoke about those four little hands, those mm-hmm. were the four little hands that you were describing. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about the journey and process in deciding to do that, wanting to do that, and then actually doing it. Yeah. So, you know, it was almost like, a, it was almost a mandate, to be honest. Like, it was almost, th- this is this is not one of those things we could kind of overlooked. So Matisse and I 
uh, you know, we're married for years. Um, you know, we tried um, to have children and, and that didn't manifest. And, and, you know, so of course that comes with a whole, that's a whole nother story, a whole nother kind of topic and or what that does to a relationship, could do to a relationship. Um, but then we got a call um, about, um, biologically, there are nieces and nephew, niece and nephew, biologically. And we got a call that their biological parents were in a position where they no longer could take care of them. They were put in foster care. And um, because of my work experience in my career, I've worked with the foster care system. And um, I've seen some really good stories, had some some really good stories, but I've heard some not so good stories as well. And, you know, the first thing I remember, <laughs> Matissa was, you know, she's a college professor, so she was on her way to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And she was taking a group of students to South Africa. I think it was like 10 students or something like that for like three weeks. So we get this call that the kids are put in foster care. And she calls me and said, babe, you got to go get them. <laughs> I said, go mm -hmm. get them. <laughs> like, wait, we, <laughs> let's have a conversation with me. Just We're going to just get them just to protect them for a little while. Like, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember calling my mother-in-law. She was still alive. Now, I had never seen the kids. I had never. I, I think I've seen pictures, but I, they had never been in my space before because they were young. And um, we lived at the time in Louisville, Kentucky. And she called, and uh, so I called my mother-in-law and said, Mom, I said, can you go with me, drive to Eastern Kentucky, Hatcher, Kentucky, and go with me so we can go pick up the kids. They were given, they were putting them in our care. We went through background checks, all that kind of stuff. And mom was like, sure. So at the time, I was working as executive director of a nonprofit that had a child development center attached to it. And I went back there and said, can I borrow some car seats? <laughs> because mm -hmm. I didn't have car seats or anything. Mm -hmm. So I took the car seats and we drove and we picked the kids up. And um, they forever changed our lives. Mm -hmm. These two, they were three and one at the time. Um, you know, the world wasn't fair to them at the early part of their lives. And I saw how the world wasn't fair to them because of, you know, things they had to deal with because of their biological parents. Um, but Matisse and I loved them for the first, for the first several years that we were auntie and uncle, they loved us as auntie and uncle and we rolled like they were our children. Now, of course we had all the questions like, when did y'all have them? You know, so, you know, cause people mm -hmm. knew us and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but then shortly after, you know, a while, Matisse and I actually prayed about it and we were like, well, you know, let's, let's make this thing you know, for real and forever. And I, we remember, I remember sitting, we set the kids down and we asked them, we said, so we're thinking about adopting y'all. How do y'all feel? And at this point, I think they're probably like seven and six or something or something. I can't remember the ages. Mm -hmm. And they both said, okay. They, I'm not sure if they even knew what that meant, but they said, okay. They said, okay, well, do you want to keep your last name or do you want to take on our last name? And I remember my son at the time, and if you know him, uh, you love him, you know, he, he's lovable, <laughs> but there's times you want to, you know, he, he, I feel my mama raising up at me when I'm sometimes dealing with him. I'll put the Vulcan bench on him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so he looked at me and said, I'm a Wilton. Mm. And at that moment, I realized, oh, we're going to again roll with this thing until the wheels fall off. And so um, we went through the adoption process and um, it was lengthy. And because we had support from um, judges in Kentucky and, and, you know, CEOs and community leaders, it was a very smooth transition. And so it's been 13 years um, that the kids have been in our care and, and adopted now for about, um, I don't know, seven of those 13 years. And so um, they're officially Wilkins. And so, it, it, and, it, and it was one of those things that she, the Matisse and I had to really pray about. And we, you know, even in tough, again, tough times, um, because you deal with a lot of the unknowns, 
when you adopt children um, that are not biologically yours in a tough time, she and I stuck together and we, we've shared with the kids over and over and over. Yeah, there's nothing, almost like the scripture that says, there's nothing that can separate the love from me. So there's nothing you can do. Um, yeah, you know, I've, um, doing this podcast and listening to so many different stories over the last two and a half years, um, there's a scripture that strengthens every time I have a conversation like this and I hear um, the stories of both the struggles, the obstacles, the triumphs, the losses, the mm-hmm. wins. And that scripture is Romans eight twenty eight, um, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, mm-hmm. um, for them who are called according to his purpose. And you guys exemplify to individuals that wow. work within the calling of your purpose. Wow, thank and you. so with all of the things that I've seen you guys go through, the grief and all those other things, there's like this beautiful rainbow on the other side of it that says, I know it was hard, yeah. but it'll be worth it. Absolutely. Right? It'll be worth it. And so thanks for sharing that. Thank I you. Thank haven't you. even got to any of my questions yet because I <laughs> wanted to get through that. Because yeah. there's so much even in that conversation, right? Because now what I really want to talk to you about, and this is another thing that I've learned, particularly with you mm-hmm. and with my friend, um, Coach Sharper, who himself was adopted. Mm-hmm. My wife was adopted. So mm-hmm. I've been around a lot of adoptive people. Yeah. But in conversation around children, Mm -hmm. There is no difference when you are talking about children as two individuals with teenage boys. Yeah. Like you, the conversations we have about. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) That moment where I was about to catch a case like that don't like change when you are responsible for someone's life. Yeah. But having said that, and in addition to that, you know, you guys are both multi-talented. You are multi-talented. You've done a lot of things in your life. You mm-hmm. do a lot of things in your life. You serve a lot of people in your yeah. life, and you serve a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, not only are you involved with us here at Fathers Incorporated, but you're also uh, part of the um, North Metro 100 Black Men um, sure. of Atlanta doing mentorship work as well. And so you always find ways to extend yourself. Yeah. And then you're also very deeply engaged in your church at the Absolutely. same time. It's yeah. like people ask me if I ever sleep. I look at you and, and Matisse and, and others that are in my circle and I wonder how do we get all of this work done? But I've come to learn that I attract people who are like me. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I don't have to question how things get done. I just know they get done. They get right? done. That's they right. just get done. So what kind of led you into this space of really not-for-profit work and serving people? I know it is part of your spiritual um, walk in life, but I mm-hmm. want to understand the mechanics of what keeps you tied to serving people. Man, you you are good, right? And I'm trying <laughs> you're good with these questions. Um, wow. So, like, I, I love people. I love people. I love serving people. Um And when I was, you know, I think about my journey, you know, again, not having a father, not having, I mean, we were poor growing up. And I I say that, but didn't know we were poor um, because mom did a really good job at making sure, you know, all the houses we stayed in, they were section eight, but they were, they were, they were decent. You know, she was paying $26 a month, but, uh, (laughs) But they were always always clean and they were always we thought we were balling um, <laughs> and until the first of the month came by and then she gave us the food coupons to go buy food. And I realized everybody didn't have these food stamps. Um, so, I, you know, I had I, I watched how my life was and, I, and I'll, I'll tell the story. My mom, uh, for years, we were we did not have much money at all. But mom, I think we were probably, and I say we, because again, I have a twin, I always talk about us together. Uh, I think we probably were in the fifth grade and mom looked, told us, she said, I'm going to college. And my mother went to school at night and went to college at night and became a, um, a social worker. And uh, when she did that, 
it changed the trajectory of our lives. So we moved from being in subsidized housing and I saw, and I, we would go to work and see her working with families and uh, coaching single moms as she was a single mother and helping um, her make a difference in people's lives. We went from living in subsidized housing to mom going after um, the Habitat for Humanity uh, process and we got a Habitat house. So we helped build our house <laughs> and mm. we literally were there every weekend building our house, literally hammer nails in walls um, as teenagers to build our house. And she became a homeowner. So that mm. changed again the trajectory. And my mother used to say this to us growing up, I don't care what you become, just do better than me. Mm. She would always, that was her line. I don't care what you do, just do better than me. I'm doing this amount, you do better than me. And so, uh, when I went away to school, I, I I was the one in the family that I think everybody thought was going to make it. Everybody. I mean, I was the, you know, the kid from the hood. Like, you're going to make it. Like, everybody looked at me as the one, as the, as the hope for all the black kids in the community. And so I went away to school and um, went to Ohio State and did my undergrad stuff there. And I remember one time it was connected to church. We were at one of our church members' homes and their teenage son was in and out of juvie, in and out of juvie. And, but he'd taken a liking to me and a respect with me. And so I started kind of mentoring him. And so one day his uh, social worker came over to the house and uh, his social worker had been talking, the, the boy had been talking about me to a social worker. And he finally got to meet me and, and whatever. And so the social worker said um, off the off the cuff, you well, you know, that organization down the street that we're work, that I'm working with, they're looking for a new director of their teen program. And I was like, oh, OK, I've never done anything like that, but I like kids. That was my entire I like kids. And so I went down and applied, um, took a shot. And when I got I eventually got hired, I was the youngest. Um, director ever hired at this organization uh, didn't know what I was doing but what I heard what the hiring folks said there's just something about you I don't I don't know what it is and I knew what it was when she said it because of my faith she said there's something about you I, I just don't know what it is and so that led me into developing youth programs from the ground up I started off with three boys in that mm -hmm. program and we built that program to 150 150 young people, non-recreation, academic focus, uh, employment focus, and that program is still intact after all these years. Um, I'm like the icon, so I'll, I'll sometimes reach out to the organization and talk to some of the folks and they say, oh my gosh, you're the one that started this program. So I started it and then my trajectory and nonprofit work moved from there to, to uh, Kentucky. And I was exec. I was a program director at a, at an organization, and got promoted. Eventually, becoming the executive director. Um, served in that capacity for a number of years. Um, then moved to the Louisville Urban League and served as the director of education. So, my my passion has always been to serve folks. As always, and and Kenny, you and I both know in the work that we do, we're not in this work to be rich. There's no. I mean, I wish we could be. But we're not in this work to be rich, but we're in, in this in this work to change lives. And so that's what we've done. That's what you and I've done. That's what I've done uh, for the last, two, you know, two decades. I've been changing lives. I, I laugh that on Facebook we have a closed group of some of the young people that I used to work with, you know, 20 years ago. I look at them now and they're married with kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm the OG, you know, <laughs> so if I speak up, you know, they'll, they'll silence. Uh, um, but it, you know, I've heard this so many times. If it wasn't for you, my life would have been. Uh, mm -hmm. One time we were for church, we were in the hood and we were doing outreach. Now, I don't know why the church always feels like you got to go to the hood is hood is part of communities. <laughs> so we're doing outreach and this car pulls up speeding with tinted windows and they all jump out the car. And so we're all like, oh, what's about to happen? And my back is turned and my wife is out there and there's some other folks. 
And there was a group of guys jump out the car and it's like, Mr. L. I said, yeah. And it was like, you don't remember me? And I was like, keep talking. Um, and so at that moment, they were like, I was going to be killed one time and you saved my life. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of those moments I said, this is, this is what I'm committing my life's work to is to make mm-hmm. sure that I'm able to influence people's lives uh, directly or indirectly. Um, mm-hmm. But I want to make sure that their lives are impacted. And so I've, I've, I've transferred that into the work I do at the church. I've been a youth pastor. I've, you know, I've served on tons of committees, mm-hmm. led groups, small groups. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's my life's work. Yeah. And you're now here in Atlanta, <clears throat> you know, you came to me like most people come to me, you know, with no resume, you know, sure. just an email that says such and such is in town. I yeah. really want you to hook up with them. I don't yeah. know where this could go. Just blah, blah, blah. You know, and you came into the office and we were supposed to be meeting for like 30 minutes or so, yeah. maybe 60 minutes and end up talking for like four hours, yeah. you know, and talking, crying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a vibe. It was a moment for sure. It was one of those God moments. I mean, we, you know, and I, I tell people all the time, you know, have, you know, meeting you when I came to the city, um, you know, I kept hearing you're overqualified. You're this, you're this, or we don't have anything, blah, blah, blah. But actually when I, when I, when I came in, um, to the city, you, you, you took a risk and I'm ever grateful, forever grateful for that. You took a risk and allowed me to show you that I'm, I'm capable of doing things if you give me a chance. And so, um, you did that. And as to your point, you've done that for so many different people. Um, and the, I, I laugh, I'm the, I'm the longest standing staff member outside of the founders, uh, mm. founder <laughs> and, and, uh, and then the CFO, I'm the longest standing member and I've seen people come and go. And, but, um, the same way that you kind of invited me into the space, the same way you invited everybody into the space. And so I, I appreciate that. No, I appreciate you. You bring, you know, a special component to, you know, not only what you do, but what we need as an organization. Um, you know, you are often, you know, there's always this term that we use is like who is Batman and who is Robin, Mm -hmm. you know, and quite honestly, there's particular situations that we're in that we switch those roles, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm comfortable with allowing someone to be Batman while I just be Robin, you know, I have to be comfortable with that. Um, And you are that in many occasions for me um, in this work and you do both those roles very, very well. Um, this fatherhood space is different, man. It's different than everything that we've done past. We both are urban leaguers, which yeah. is a unique aspect <clears throat> of who we are. The urban league trains people yeah. to be a particular way to have a uh, zest for a particular level of excellence yeah. um, that most not-for-profits don't have. Very focused, very professional. Um, very tactical, very logical, mm-hmm. um, and 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 that's just um, driven. Yeah. Urban leaguers, every urban leaguer I've ever met are driven people. Yeah. They are extremely yeah. driven, and I brought that with me when I came to Fathers Incorporated because I was a vice president of the Urban League of Northeast mm-hmm. New York, and that was just what we brought to the table. Shawnee, along with myself, worked for the same Urban League, so mm-hmm. that meticulous way that we work with Fathers Incorporated comes from how we function um, within the infrastructure of the Urban League. But this fatherhood space is something different, man. Since you've been here doing this work around fatherhood, what is the thing that stands out the most to you about being an agency that serves fathers? Um, So, you know, it it was totally a leap of faith and different than the work that I've ever done. Because again, I did youth development, community organizing. Um, You know, I was a voice um, for so many. Um, But then when you get into fatherhood work, you realize that these are men who have their own voices, who have their own way of doing things. And you could be a guide for them, a coach, if you will, but they're going to make their own decisions. 
and you have to you you have to recognize that they're creative resource one whole. So they're going to find a way to get whatever they need. Um, and so I think the biggest thing that was different for me was allowing these men to be them authentic, their authentic selves and to rise to the occasion. And so what we've seen in the, in the programs that we've had is that individuals start at a place and then we've seen them grow to a different place, but they tapped into their own um, internal power, um, but allowed us to help guide them into that place. And so um, that was a, that was the and I guess you could see that in any cohort of folks that you work with. But it was it was real uh, prevalent when working with fathers. If fathers are, you know, they're you can't you can't go into the situation like you're telling them what to do because there's there's something innate in them that shows that they 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 have their their own footing. They can do what they want to. The second part I would say that was most most also the challenging piece is part of my role is around funds development and. You know, there's this misnomer and this misconception out there that because men have their own footing and they should be able to stand on their own two feet, that there's no need for support, financial support of of type of these type of programs, which is not true. Um, and so that was that's been a challenge. And I think what's helped us over the years is the amount of work that you and I, other members of our, of our team have done to make sure that the narrative is correct and really build relationships so folks understand the importance of building stronger families. And the way we do that is building it that one father at a time. And so um, the direct impact of us building fam building a strong father is eventually going to, as a byproduct, strengthen his family, his children. And, um, you know, so those are the two things, you know, recognizing that these men have their own authentic power within and allowing them to kind of work through that. And then the second thing is looking at how folks have a misconception that uh, fatherhood programs don't need support because they should have uh, things already locked down and ready to go. So those that was the biggest challenge for me when I got into this work. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because a lot of people want to get into this work. They want to do fatherhood work. You know, what we've seen is it's easy to find elements of the work to get into with no capital. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to scale, um, to provide comprehensive services that is sustainable over time and stable during the times that people need you most. For yeah. us, I tell people all the time that during the pandemic, we doubled in size. Absolutely. Um, and we did exactly what we were supposed to do, which was to be available for people when they most needed us, because we saw a lot of organizations go down, yeah. um, you know, during the pandemic. And I think that any um, time that we will eventually be in some level of societal crisis, um, Fathers Incorporated will get bigger and expand yeah. that's that's who we are um while you're out there doing this work particularly around development and community engagement because that's also an important partnership right mm -hmm. and so uh what has been the biggest challenge for you as you have tried to present this work that we do to those that we're looking to support us um I, you know i think it, it, it has been the um misalignment or the the um the word ignorance coming to my head but the <laughs> ignorance that folks have about how fathers should be operating um and so it's the it's it's going out over explaining the importance of supporting programs um you know of fatherhood programs it's going and almost doing the dance to say we matter too. Um, it, it's, it's beating the drum um, to get people to even to recognize that you're beating the drum. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 and you know, one of the things I think that we did well is folks, and you've said this since I've been here, people would rather give the babies than to puppies, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think one of the things we've done well is 
um, make sure that our narrative includes the babies, includes the strengthening right. of the family. And the so babies carrying puppies. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think when we started kind of changing some of that language a little bit, people mm-hmm. were more apt to hear us. And I'm not saying that's right, but that's the approach we had to take. And so, um, you know, and so, as I mentioned, strengthen one, you know, families, one father at a time. That's what we do. And it, it's been that constant on the ground, trying to make sure people understand the importance of supporting this type of work. And so I think from, you know, you and I've done this from the grass, from the grass, was a grass level, gra- grassroots level to the rooftop level. We've been. Um, in community, we've been in legis- legislation sessions. Uh, we've talked to mayors. We've talked. I mean, we've done it all, um, just to make sure that this work does not fall under the radar and that it's ever uh, prevalent on people's minds. And so, it, it's been a work. It's definitely been a work. Mm-hmm. So, and and I'll say this last week. You know, one of the things that you mentioned about the you know, the struggles and, and stuff like that. I think that's also, as I was talking about, even in my relationship with my wife, the struggles and the traumatic experiences like during COVID and, you know, how the world changed, that actually bonded, I believe, our staff, which bonded the organization. And so, as I mentioned, anytime there's a traumatic experience, it could either break or make. And um, I think we put our, our stake in the ground and said, we're going to make this work. Mm-hmm. And um, when we did that, as you said, we doubled in size. We uh, serve more fathers um, than we've ever served. Mm-hmm. Um, and the trajectory for that is, is going higher and higher. So um, mm-hmm. now I think in my five years, we're now getting the recognition and notoriety that um, we deserve. Now, it, it's taken time and you've been doing this for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can say in the last five years, I now see people are open up in the philanthropic community, open, open, more open now to really start having these conversations um, around fatherhood. Mm-hmm. You know, and part of it is, you know, and I talked about being urban leaguers, you know, it's easy to um, advocate for an organization that's been around 100 plus years, right? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. when you're talking about the Urban League and yeah. more specifically, or not more specifically, but in addition, um, the NAACP, yeah. right? So other than fraternities, you mm-hmm. know, and sororities and fraternal organizations and churches, we don't have much that has lasted and maybe some HBCUs mm-hmm. that have lasted, you know, close to 100 years. Yeah. Um, there ain't many not-for-profits that were started you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, that are still around and have that level of national um, relevance to people. Mm -hmm. 100 black men might be the closest to it, right? Um, Being able to um, be the lightning rod for when tragedy strikes and people want to support, particularly in a financial way. So it has always been my desire, you know, over the next 10 years or so that Fathers Incorporated is mentioned in the same sentence as the Urban League, the NAACP, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, yeah. YMCA, yeah. Um, and, and and organizations as such. Um, as you're doing this work, like what's 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 the next level for fatherhood work, and more specifically for Fathers Incorporated, that we really need to focus on achieving? Yeah. So I, I you know, <clears throat> my. Um I love the strength in the family piece. So, you know, digging deeper in how we engage the entire family and making sure the entire family is being served again with the father in mind of being the, the avenue vehicle, the way we do it. Um, and then I think about, you know, policy work and advocacy stuff that, you know, that's, that's, I guess that's the urban league part of me as well, but making sure, you know, Um, laws that are legal processes that are on the books that are impacting, such as legitimation that are impacting um, uh, fathers, uh, more importantly or more specifically, black fathers. Um, 
um, that we kind of help eradicate some of those kind of things. Um, mm-hmm. Because we really can't have a conversation about um, uh, economic development and, and a conversation, you know, people talk about reparations and, mm-hmm. you know, all these kind of conversations until we look at some of the, the policies and the systemic uh, issues that are holding folks back. We can't even, we can't move past um, those kind of things. It's almost like trying to put a, a Band-Aid on, on, a, on a knife wound, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have to deal with the systemic issues and uh, I mentioned legitimation, that's one of those things. It is, it is, it is really creating um, more separation in families. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, research it probably is probably out there. I'm not a researcher. I can ask my wife this, but I'm sure that as you separate more families and have these systemic issues, it creates a cycle of poverty, a cycle of the same kind of behavior that will continue because families are, are ripped apart. Now, there's the, I mean, you look at, you know, timing from times, you know, during the slave trade and things like that, families were separated and legitimation, as an example, is, is mirrors that same type of separation between the, the dads and the families. Um, mm-hmm. Just the same thing as a lot of the uh, Section 8 policies and those things, they separate families. And so really looking at advocacy work and, um you know, trying to look in some of these policies um, that are separating families. I think that should be our next, and that should be fatherhood work across the board, but I think uh, Fathers Incorporated should really continue to dig deeper into that work. Mm -hmm. The other element that kind of guides us is there has been some conversations lately around the whole notion of faith-based organizations and what they look like and how they serve the community, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's this separation of church and state and mm-hmm. churches who are apprehensive about being involved and receiving federal funds or governmental funds under the belief that they believe that if they receive those funds that somehow they're going to lose their ability to yeah. advance yeah. their faith and particularly their congregations and their and their religions. Um, but I was um, having a conversation the other day with someone and I said, you know, we need to kind of take some time to readjust and redefine Faith based, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because when we say faith based, we mean institutions of faith, and we should start embracing faith led, right? Mm-hmm. And faith led is organizations that are led by their faith, right? Mm-hmm. They may not incorporate a religious doctrine. Um, but it is their faith that drives them much like you and ours to do the yeah. work that we yeah. do because it is part of our spiritual calling, That's you right. know, to work with people. And for me specifically to speak to the hearts of men, yeah. like why is it important at least for fathers incorporated to always ensure that faith is the driver of why we do what we do and how we do what we do? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. My, the image popping in my head is a North Star. Like if you have a North Star, mm-hmm. if faith is our North Star, and that's the that's the goal that we're reaching, that we have to have something to reach towards. And so I think if faith is our our guiding factor of why we do what we do, I mean, we all wake up every day because faith is part of it as our purpose. We wake up every day realizing that today could be the day. You know, today could be the day that we secure this amount of money. Today could be the day that we eradicate these policies. Uh, today could be the day. And faith is the reason why we can every day wake up feeling that today can actually be the day. And so I think we have, you know, it's important for organizations personally that us, for all of us to have something that is guiding us to that North star. And, um, I think for Fathers Incorporated, I think we've done a great job of not pr- not pushing religion, but pushing that same feeling, that same motivation of purpose that keeps us going every day. Because today could be the day. 
Um, and so I wake up every day like that, uh, mm-hmm. thinking, you know, something has to break, something got to give, it has mm-hmm. to happen. And so, mm-hmm. uh, faith has, has allowed me to uh, believe that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, lastly, as we close this out, you know, we were talking about our children, which we got to come back and talk about <laughs> fathering teenage boys. We got to come back and that's got to be a whole conversation. That, that'd be stuff. funny. That's going to be a, listen, <laughs> you, we should do a panel on that because that is the, because, you know, we got some people in our circle, I think about like James and, and, uh, and their, mm-hmm. their sons are, you know, getting older, right? right? And some of us are still, you know, there our sons are still growing. And I want to hear from some of these people who've made it through because there are days I sit back and I say to myself, yeah, I, I probably would look horrible in orange. Um, right. Because you're going to have me catch a case. Uh, But I'm going to go back. I ain't going to go forward. I'm going to go back, you know, to some of these youngins, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we are now looking at serving fathers, you know, within this 16 to 24-year-old range who are uh, Generation Zers. And they're a different breed. Our kids are Generation Zers, right? And so when you think about this young uh, population of fathers out there, if you had to give them some advice, uh, what would that advice be? Um, I know it's going to sound negative, but you don't know everything and listen to somebody who knows some stuff. You know, we, we have experience under our belt. And I think, you know, if you look at this generation, they feel like, and they know a lot of stuff, but they feel like they know sometimes more than we know. And I imagine there's other generations that felt the same way, uh, but this generation is different. So I would say to a young father, get, you don't know everything. So get that, get, get around people who know some stuff um, and it'll keep you from uh, falling into some ditches that you don't have to fall into uh, specifically around parenting. You know, we've always talked about, there's no blueprint, no book on good parenting. I mean, on how to parent because every situation is different. Um, my wife and I thought that our kids were going to be, uh, at this age, we thought they were positioned for Michelle or to be a Barack and Michelle Obama, because we believe we're Barack and Michelle Obama. <laughs> um, but then our kids say, no, I want to be, uh, this actress. I'm like, no, but you can be, you can be an attorney of the actresses. No, I want to be an actress. And so you're like, you're going to be an actress. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a, it's a different, it's a different way uh, to parent. But if I was talking to young fathers that age, get some, get some wisdom from folks that have experienced some stuff. Wow. Thank you so much, brother, man. It is both an Thanks, honor man. and a pleasure um, always to be in your presence, to be working alongside with you um, and your awesome wife. Um, along with your children, um, your experiences, you know, your um, advice, your wisdom, all of that good stuff. It adds so much, um, not only to our organization, but to me personally. And I thank you um, so much for who you are and what you bring to the world and to the space. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Thanks again for the invitation. And I appreciate you and all the work that you're doing to change lives every day. Thank you. And to all my I Am Dad podcast listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. You know how I like to leave you. Always be kind to others as you're kind to yourself or you might find yourself by yourself. Always shoot high for your goals because even if you miss, you'll be amongst the stars. And that's my good friend, Art Mitchell, and my longtime friend who passed away last year, John Harris. It's nice to be important, but it's so much more important to be nice until next Sunday. Peace out. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad Podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time. I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand. 
that I am dad, period.